Hello, everybody, and welcome to the About to Interview podcast. I'm your host, as always, that guy named John. This show focuses on the interviews I have with actors, directors, authors, and other creators, and is a subsidiary of the About to Review podcast, which covers weekly TV shows, movies, comics, as well as national and international film festivals and conventions. You can follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at About to Review. And make sure to subscribe, like, rate, and review the podcast on Apple Podcast, Blueberry, Stitcher, Google Play, TuneIn, and of course, youtube.com slash about to review. You can visit abouttreview.threadless.com to buy some swag and merchandise, and head on over to abouttreview.com to support the show by clicking the support tab, as well as seeing full show notes with all of the links to the guests in the show notes. So now, on to the show. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Called the Citizen Kane of bad movies, I am now joined by one of the stars of the original picture, The Room, from 2003. Welcome to the show, Robin Paris. Thank you so much for having me, John. It's great to be here. Yeah, so we last saw each other at the Vancouver Web Fest up in Vancouver, British Columbia, and that was the first time... I got the chance to see this first kind of collection that you did of your new show, The Room Actors, Where Are They Now? This show has been on the festival circuit for about a year now. Mm -hmm. um, we started at Rain Dance Film Festival, and we just finished our festival run in Rio, the Rio Web Fest. Um, and so it's, but it's going to be coming out um, on Thursday, November 30th mm -hmm. on Funny or Die. Robin was very uh, gracious in that she sent me a copy to watch, even though I had watched, uh, I thought I had seen all of it at the Van Webb Fest. Apparently, I did not, because then I was able to watch it again, which, spoiler alert, I have actually watched it more than one time from beginning to end. Uh, so, That's good. yeah, so Robin sent that to me. I had a chance to watch these first kind of three episodes that, you know, you kind of did, was it? Would you think of it as a pilot? Yes. When I first did it, I actually did it as a, as a like a 25 minute pilot, not mm -hmm. as a web series. Gotcha. And then I realized after I did it that I it would be better if I chopped it up and did two two actors per episode, two room actors per episode. It's just too many uh, actors to cover mm -hmm. in a pilot, and I thought it worked best as a short form series. So I broke it up and turned it into a web series. Um, and then I actually just shot a new episode on October 22nd that we're in the process of editing. So that's going to come out on Funny or Die on December 20th because we're releasing one episode per week for four weeks. Nice. So your um, listeners can see the first episode as of yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, or as of today. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but then they'll have to wait a week to see, you know, each week a new one comes out. And we'll have a fourth episode that you haven't seen yet coming out. Um, and we're editing that rapidly now, trying to get it ready. Awesome. That means I have to go back to being kind of a quote unquote normal person who has to wait to see the episode. I'm not sure how I feel about that. Um... I will t I completely send it to you. Although it's worse, like it's still in the works. So I'm right. not sure how far in advance it'll be. But totally I'll fair. Send it to you. Uh, I mean, I definitely am, am on board regardless. So as we we're talking about your new show, The Room Actors, Where Are They Now? If we go in the Wayback Machine to approximately maybe 2001-ish, when you first auditioned for The Room, tell me about yes. that process. And at the time, did you have any idea what you were getting into? <laughs> 
I no. No, okay. <laughs> in a, in a, short, a short answer is no. I mean, because I never would have thought that there would a James Franco movie would be made uh, based on The Room. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess I was just, I don't even know if I knew who James Franco was back then, but right. maybe I did. Um, I like Freaks and Geeks. But mm-hmm. um, so, yeah, I don't think I ever could have predicted it would be at this point. Mm-hmm. But um, I knew it was a really bad movie. I knew I was getting into a, a horrible movie. Really? But I was so from, from the from beginning? <laughs> Well, yeah, because the script pages were even the audition process was crazy. And I met Tommy, you know, I went to the set, met Tommy Wiseau, and he asked me a bunch of questions about acting. I answered them all. And after that, he was like, I think I cast you. And he hadn't (laughs) even I hadn't even auditioned. We see part of that in the new film, The Disaster Artist, uh, which we're referencing with James Franco. We see kind of some of those behind the scenes. And so now that I had the opportunity to really sit down and, and talk with you, it sounds like they kind of nailed it from, from what we saw in yeah. the film. It sounds like your experience of just kind of talking and then suddenly you were offered a role. <laughs> totally. I mean, they were, the, the, they did nail it in the disaster artist, the, the audition process, the mm-hmm. way it's kind of depicted with just random the movie, and this is what happened, so it's no surprise or spoiler because you can read the book, right. The Disaster Artist. And, you know, I'll tell you that when you when we auditioned, they, you know, Tommy was like, okay, you just won the lottery, go. And then you'd have to be screaming with like, oh, my God, I won the lottery. And then he'd say, now your f- best friend just died, go. And then he wanted you to immediately start crying. <laughs> um, and, and he would just randomly yell things at you, and you were supposed to switch gears. And, and so the, um, the, the Disaster Artist, it definitely shows that, that it was just so random, the stuff he was having mm-hmm. you do. And then his decision to cast you uh, was also, it seemed a little <laughs> random. And they definitely <laughs> captured that in the uh, movie. Okay. Which I think comes out number first. Yeah. So when you were when you were first looking at those script pages, did it feel like a real script? Like as you're looking through, did it have any sort of structure to it that you would expect from a traditional script? Uh, well, you know, no, uh, <laughs> in a nutshell, but, uh, it, it, we also didn't see the whole script. Um, we only saw the pages that we were uh, going to be in, like whatever scene we were going to be in mm-hmm. Tommy. I asked for the script, but Tommy told me that he didn't want to give it to me because he thought I would steal it. And he thought any, everybody would steal it. So he didn't give the script to literally anybody. None wow. of the actors had saw the script. So we never knew like what scene came where in the whole, uh, you know, sequence of the movie. Right. So we were filming like um, the the chocolate is a symbol of love scene, and I mm-hmm. didn't know where that fell. And then I'd film a, a scene with Juliet, and I, I was supposed to be like disappointed in her for having this affair, and I didn't know where that fell because in another scene I was supposed to be like conspirator conspiratorial and really having fun with the fact that she was having this affair. And I was like, but where does, like, where does this fit? Mm -hmm. Why am I, like, disappointed, you know, judging her in one scene and then, like, think it's really funny in another scene? I don't. So I assume there was a rhyme and a a reason, sort. I mean, I should have known better than just assume that. But (laughs) there were, yeah, there was just no, we we never saw the script. So I I had to go based on the pages, which I were were not that, I'm a shocker, were not very well written. Uh, right. <laughs> so that's kind of why I knew it wasn't going to be a good film. Also, I was there on set, you know, so mm-hmm. I, I witnessed, you know, what you see in the movie, The Disaster Artist and read about in the book, that all happened. So I witnessed all that. And, and yeah, if you witness that, then you know, this is not going to really turn out well. Right. So <laughs> I definitely, there are three days in particular that I really want to hear about. I want to hear about your first day on set, your last day on set, and then the first time you saw the film. Because in The Disaster Artist, you know, kind of the, and this is not really spoiling, but there, you know, he has the premiere of his film at the end of the movie. And Mm -hmm. kind of judging by different history of what actually happened at that premiere. So I want to know your first day on set, your last day on set, and then when you actually got to see the movie, whether it was at the premiere or at something else? Yes. Um, the first day on set, I I got a call from Greg. I was at home. I didn't even know I was going to be on set that day. And I got a call. I, I didn't know I had the part, frankly. 
Okay. I got a call from Greg. He said, how fast can you get to the set? And I said, wait, does this mean I have the part? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so, but yeah, before we go there, like, so is this a yes? No contracts were signed, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> no, it was no, like, you have the role. It was like, <laughs> I'm just calling to see how fast can you get to the set? Because <laughs> I, had, I had been to the callback. There was a callback and Tommy called two people back for the role of Michelle me and one other woman who mm-hmm. I became friends with and she went on to do completely different things, which is good for her. Mm-hmm. Um, but she was an extra in, in that. But anyway, he, so that had been a week before I got the call from Greg saying, how fast can you get to the set? And I said, um, you know, I guess I can get there in 45 minutes. I was dressed and clothed and showered, which is a rare thing <laughs> in uh, when you're an inspiring actor. A, a struggling actor day. when you're in your pajamas and sweats all day. <laughs> Exactly. Depressed because you have no auditions. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so I drove to the set and I, from the moment I got there, basically they just like powdered my nose. They shoved me the lines and then they pushed me onto the set to shoot the chocolate as a symbol of love scene. So wait, that was your was first wearing, day? My first day. I was still wearing my own clothes. Wow. My own. Like they didn't do anything other than just like powder the nose, throw me on set and say, you're fil- shooting this scene right now. Take a look at it while we powder your nose. So I l- had about 20 minutes to look at those pages. Granted, it's not brain surgery and it's not, <laughs> right. you know, uh, Citizen Kane or anything. But um, so I, yeah, <laughs> I shot that horrible scene after we, after we shot it, I thought, yeah, th- what am I doing? Like how, but it was too late. We'd already shot it. Like right. <laughs> I didn't have time to think. And time to reconsider. It wasn't like I was sitting around in the set waiting. I mean, mm-hmm. it just happened really fast. So from and from then, the first call <laughs> to the chocolate is a symbol of love scene, it sounds like it was a couple hours. It was like an hour and a half because it takes Jeez. 45 minutes to get from Santa Monica to Hollywood, which is right. a good 45 minutes of it. The next 45 minutes was being there and then being shoved on the set. And like literally it was just so fast. Yeah. Hour 45 tops by the time I was practically done with the scene (laughs) (laughs) and then after that scene did you have any next script pages or it was like all right moving on to the next scene completely I think at the end of the the day Tommy shoved me a couple more pages and said you know we're gonna shoot this tomorrow and it was maybe two other a couple of other pages um And again, you know, I was like, but could I figure out where this falls in the Mm -hmm. context of the film? And they were like, no, you'll steal it. So, you know, just the next I remember sitting around most of the time on the set, just waiting for Tommy to arrive, which is also depicted in the disaster artist. Mm -hmm. But he's late. He was late to set a lot, as in like four hours late. Oh, (laughs) Um, And so we sat around a lot waiting for him to uh, get there. Sometimes we just sit all day and never actually shoot any scenes because Tommy didn't get there. Sheesh. Now, in some productions, when you have downtime, totally usable time because you're like, cool, how about we go over some lines? How about we go over some blocking? But if everybody only has two pages, three pages of random (laughs) scripts of random scenes, that is a lot of time just to hang out. Yeah, it was a lot of time hanging out, talking to people, talking to each other, being followed around by the documentarian because there was a guy following us with a camera on set and just trying to capture all our conversations, which is, again, depicted in The Disaster Artist. And it's true. I remember I was trying to change one time for a scene and I had to duck between a couple cars because that documentarian guy was like following me with the camera. And I was like, dude, I have to change. He's like, I don't care. I'm supposed to catch everything. Whoa. And uh, like, yeah, catch everything yeah. over there, not here. <laughs> yeah. So I was kind of afraid to talk because every time I turned around, there was like a camera in my face. Wow. So, yeah, I got at one point, I just sort of was like, I'm going to stop talking because my mom said, if you can't, you know, say something nice, don't say anything at all. So I think I'll just not say anything at this point on set. <laughs> so with this documentarian running around the whole time for a movie that none of you really knew what the movie was going to be. And yet he had wanted the whole process documented. Are we ever going to see that footage? Do you think? I don't know, but I do know it exists. And I know that James Franco and Dave Franco watched a lot of it. Really? Um, And they're, 
inspiration for the disaster artist. Yeah, I guess Tommy made it available to them and the screenwriters um, to to do some research because I met them at the, one of the disaster artist screenings. Mm-hmm. Um, and Dave Franco told me they had seen it and they'd watched a lot of the footage. And James Franco mentioned it too. And so did Scott Newstater. I think that's how you pronounce his last name. Mm-hmm. But um, so, yeah, it exists. I don't, I think it would be amazing for them to release it. But absolutely. Um, <laughs> I think Tommy's, you know, maybe a little too, uh, contr- he's a little too controlling about that. I, I think he, um, <laughs> he, he just doesn't want that out there because it has all kinds of stuff that happened on set. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, he's a private person. He likes the lore like the lore of Tommy and like, he won't tell people where he's from. And I think he also well, no, he, had he totally is. He is open and honest of where he is from. He is from new Orleans. So, you know, right. Problem solved. <laughs> Mystery. Exactly. Solved. I know. What am I thinking? I know he's very honest about all that stuff <laughs> and where the money comes from and mm-hmm. the $6 million to make the room. Who knows where that came from? <laughs> Which whenever people hear about that and they see this, you know, independent feature and they hear six million dollars the first question is usually where like where did that money go and then when you read the disaster artist when you see the movie the disaster artist you realize again he it sounds like he did not really have a concept of how to make a movie he just wanted to make it so having two film crews and a documentarian it sounds like the whole time yeah that is pretty crazy it is it is i remember first when i first heard that there were two cameras wired together like that basically duct taped um (laughs) a film camera and a video digital video camera Mm -hmm. and that was back in 2003 when digital was just kind of coming out and it was Mm -hmm. both of those were very expensive at the time especially i mean back then digital was more expensive than it is now right and it was like, why? And every that's what the crew kept asking, why? And like Tommy, uh, I'm sorry, Sandy Sinclair, who's played by Seth Rogen in the movie. Mm-hmm. That's what he was constantly saying. Like, why, Tommy? Why are you doing with two cameras? And I remember him <laughs> always talking about that. Always. Wow. Because, uh, I mean, yeah. It was weird. Yeah. I mean, it is weird. And just the technical aspects. One type of camera shoots differently than another type of camera. <laughs> Yeah, and they're lit differently. Scenes are lit differently, and I mean, I think they ended up using mostly the digital video from what it looks like. If you watch the room, mm-hmm. it doesn't look like it's it's on film. Yeah, but I don't know. So maybe there's some bits. Okay, that they used. So, so that was mainly film. talking about your first day and those experiences, which yeah. again, it really sounds like they nailed in in this latest. Movie, And I think a lot of that comes from, I mean, the book that that Greg Sestero wrote or co-authored, The Disaster Artist, when you have somebody who lived through it and wrote this book and then they are like, okay, we want to make this into a movie. How about we use this book that details everything? (laughs) So so that was kind of your, your first experiences with it, which is insane that you went from phone call to infamous (laughs) chocolate scene (laughs) within about an hour and 45 minutes. So... That and was it your... was too late to back out by then. Oh, yeah, of course. After you film something like that, you're kind of pot committed. You're like, okay, now I have to see what happens next. Right. <laughs> so then what about your last day on set? Tell me about that and how it felt. Did it feel like it was a complete project or was it just another day at the office? So my last day on set was the day we shot that party scene where at the end of the movie, The Room, where Tommy and Greg get in a big fight because Greg's Mm -hmm. slow dancing with Lisa and Uh blatantly cheating on him right there. Right. Oh, my gosh. That made me laugh so hard while we were filming it because just thinking about it makes me laugh because she was trying to hide the affair Mm -hmm. and yet she's slow dancing and like talking really romantically with with uh, Mark mm-hmm. right there in front of Tommy. I'm like, wait, this just <laughs> doesn't make sense. Like, if you're trying to hide an affair, why are you doing that? And then um, the scene where we all file, she goes, come on, guys, let's go outside, you know, mm-hmm. for the party or on the rooftop. So I'll go literally filing out one by one. <laughs> 
And then she shuts the door and she's left back there with, with Mark. Right. That <laughs> cracked me up too because we're all sitting there having a good time at a party and she says, Hey guys, let's go outside and we all just we just drop everything. Like <laughs> drop your food, drop right. this. And you just rush out the door. Like, sounds great, you know, it's just so illogical. So I was laughing so hard at that entire time. And then also we shot the um the same night, I think we shot the um I'm expect she we're expecting. Mm-hmm. And then she walks over and, and I sit down with the guy playing Steven, mm-hmm. Greg Ellery, and we say like Basically, we're really disappointed in her, and he's like, "I feel like we're sitting on an atomic bomb, and it's about to go off." And those lines, and again, uh-huh. those lines were ridiculous. And then I think I have that line of, um, "I just don't understand you, Lisa." And I remember right. trying to. Get that, that was so ridiculous to me. It was like I was looking off into the distance, talking to nobody because she was already gone by then. Oh, really? I had to say that line to her, <laughs> and. It just was so ridiculous. And I remember just laughing so hard and thinking, but he, at that point, that was my last day on set. And I witnessed all this stuff up to that point. And I thought, if anybody, this, nobody will see this. If anybody ever does, it could get a cult following just because of how ridiculous it is and how uh, there's so many non sequiturs and the lines don't go together and they mm-hmm. don't make sense. And there's some ridiculous lines. And I was like, people might really like this. Depending, I didn't know all the amazing other parts of the room that I saw at the premiere, like rooftop scene and stuff I didn't witness on set. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, the prizes, surprises just kept delivering. Like the gifts just kept coming once I finally saw the room. But I had a sort of an idea that it, this could could be really pretty funny. Um, so, and that was the last day on set. And the next day they shot some more of that party scene and I couldn't be there. So you'll see part of the room. There's like a lot of background people and I'm mm-hmm. not in, I'm not in that like towards the very end when they did the suicide scene right um, leading up to that. I just couldn't be there. I had to go somewhere. Gotcha. So at that point, you anyway, knew yes, that- you knew it was your last day on set, though, just based on some production notes. Um, yeah, because I, I was leaving to go out of town and I had told Tommy that that I was going to be leaving and I, I had to finish up my and they had told me they would be finished. Um, and they were finished with all my lines, so they just needed they just needed to do some more party stuff, and they needed people in the background. Like when the fight breaks out, mm-hmm. I, I don't think I'm in. No, wait, I'm, I am in that scene. <laughs> There's a couple other se- uh, shot moments in that party that I'm not in that I had mm-hmm. to leave that they shot the next day. But anyway, yeah, a lot of us, you know, they depict in the disaster artist that, that it just kept going and going. Mm-hmm. It was supposed to be it was like a 40 day shoot or something, Jeez. and it started as a 20. It just kept going. So we had to move on. People had other get gigs or other jobs or I was going out of town and I had said that up front. And so, I mean, that's why Kyle, he left midway through and his character is totally replaced by Greg Ellery. <laughs> right. So Peter leaves and comes in and takes over his role. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Lots of craziness. So after that last day, how much time was it between <laughs> when you left the set and you either got the call or an email being like, the date of the premiere is is X, we want you there? Like, how much time was that between last day and the first time you actually got to see it in a theater? I believe we finished shooting in the summer. And I think the premiere was in the fall. I think it was a few months. Okay. Um, I don't know exactly how long it was, like maybe four months. Okay. Did you, um, during that did four months, before. oh, so you, you had not seen anything during that time? Right, nothing. <laughs> not till the premiere. Okay. So then, night of the premiere, <laughs> you go, yeah, <laughs> tell me what you were feeling at that time. Yeah, so um, I, you know, I pull her up and I see there's a spotlight out front of the Lamley Fairfax, mm-hmm. and I'm like, oh my, there's a spotlight for this movie. Come <laughs> right. on, what? I couldn't believe it. Just what? And so, um, and there's a red carpet out front, and there are a ton of people, and I'm like, why are the, where, where do these people come from? Right. Like, how do people know about this? Um, so I just pull up and I parallel park on a side street. And um, walk up and um, I don't know, it's just, I just kind of saw some people I knew and started talking. 
And then someone pointed at me and said, she's in the movie. And then the people who were there who were actually hired PR people, Mm -hmm. um, Tommy had hired some PR people to ask, to ask for the autographs of the room actors. So those people started coming up and asking for our autograph. They haven't even even seen the movie yet. Wow. And no, nobody wants my autograph. Come on. Like that's ridiculous. (laughs) And, um, and so I, you know, I was like, why are these people asking? And it came out that Tommy had hired them specifically to ask for autographs from the actors. So then I see the limo come by a couple times and it's Tommy's limo and it blows past a few times, like in the disaster. A few times, not just (laughs) once. (laughs) I mean, it just flew past a few times and we're like, are they ever going to get out? Wow. Um, and so then eventually they got out and there was just a huge hubba, like a circus and a hubbub about mm-hmm. them getting out. Like it was Tommy and Greg and maybe a few other people um, who weren't actors in the movie, just other people they knew. And he had again hired these people to take pictures and ask for their autographs and sort of mob around them to mm-hmm. make it seem like a, big deal right um because i've been in other indie movies and you go to the premiere and like nobody's asking for your autograph nobody even knows you're in it and it's not a big deal and those are usually (laughs) friends and family screenings with like 30 people at the premiere (laughs) exactly so but he had invited a lot of press and um we all filed in and a lot of people left within the first five minutes a lot of press left and it got panned, of course, by mm-hmm. a couple, you know, you know, outlets and uh, a lot of people left. So people just there was a mass exodus probably at that first love scene in the room, which happens within the first five minutes. I was going to say the, within the first <laughs> and, five and minutes, filing, <laughs> pouring out of the theater, like just leaving. And we were all like, oh, my God, what, what what's going on? Because I didn't know about the love scenes and I definitely didn't know about the recycled component of the love scene. So mm-hmm. that was hilarious. Um, but yeah, so, uh, then it just got funnier and funnier watching the movie. It just, it it got really, really funny. Um, and you talked about, you know, the movie, the disaster artist, the Mm -hmm. way they depict the premiere and it's, it definitely didn't happen like that. The, um, the movie got a nice golden Hollywood golden brush stroke ending of, uh, everything's great, Mm -hmm. but it it invented ended up being great for Tommy and Greg, Tommy, not really Greg. I mean, Greg, it's great for Greg, but it wasn't Greg's baby. Like he was just sort of a lot like Greg is, I think Greg didn't, doesn't take credit for like the room. (laughs) Like he was just Mm -hmm. there with Tommy and he was, you know, his good friend and helping him make it. But I don't think Greg was really invested in and thought that this was going to be some masterpiece the way Tommy did. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we all got a real the people who stayed in the theater got quite a treat. It was very, very funny. I was literally crying with laughter because I was trying not to laugh but right. because Tommy was sitting in front of me. And he oh, wanted no. it to be a searing drama. <laughs> right. Um, but it was crazy. And we were all laughing and it just got so funny. There were so many funny parts. You know, if you've seen The Room, you know how oh, yeah. funny it is. But there was, I was like a, just a fan watching it because – there were so many scenes I didn't know about. I wasn't there for them, like the rooftop, the Chris R mm-hmm. scene, the Kyle getting shoved over the edge of the, you know, the recycled love scenes. Mm-hmm. I didn't know about that. Denny sitting on the ground for no apparent reason, right beside a chair. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I just definitely the door, have cancer. The so the cancer scene, <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, that scene. I mean, I didn't know about any of that. So I was dying laughing just like fans do now. And Mm -hmm. I thought it was hilarious. And then my husband and I, the next day were quoting lines to each other and literally crying. Like we could not stop crying with laughter. So I know that if we experience that, then, and we're in, I'm in it, but there there have to be other people who feel the same way Mm -hmm. and love it and think it's hilarious. So it was just, it was like a special (laughs) crazy film that, to end up as funny as it as it is is a rarity in bad movies, I think. Amazing. Um, but yeah, the, the the movie makes it seem like it consolidates time. It makes it seem like at the end of the um, at the end of the premiere, everyone was cheering Tommy and like chanting, right, right. which they do now at screen of the of room. Of course, but it didn't happen there. 
uh, there was an awkwardness at the end and sort of like we all went to the after party and we were all just standing around looking around like, oh, my gosh, what do we say? Who, who, what do we do? Like, mm-hmm. how do we say to this is a great movie? And how can we lie that blatantly? Like, right. I mean, I don't think I'm that great of a liar. I just can't do it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so it was um, hard to uh, the after party was very awkward. OK. So after all yeah. of that amazing experience that you had, crying from tears of laughter, the movie comes out, it premieres, it plays for a short amount of time. But what was it like the first time somebody recognized you in the real world from the room? Apparently not somebody who had been paid to be there, which I did not even know that was part of the story, <laughs> which is amazing. And the thing that I will always respect with Tommy as an independent filmmaker, it is it is difficult sometimes when you make a film and you're like, cool, I want to I want distribution. I want you know to make some money. The fact that he still owns all of that stuff and he can control it is tremendous. And he can apparently control the press that it gets because he paid people to be there. So after the premiere, it plays for a little bit. What was it like the first time somebody recognized you? from the room when you were in the real world. You know, it's funny is this is sort of weird and ironic is I, I graduated from film school at UCLA mm-hmm. in 2008 and we were at a um, party at a local hotel for the people who graduated and somebody came up to me there and then recognized me and said, you know, are you in the room? And he, they weren't, they weren't graduating from UCLA with me. They were just there at the hotel. And mm-hmm. I said, yeah, and they said, oh, my gosh, that's so crazy. And they said, you won't believe it, but over there in the corner is Judd Apatow and um, who else? I don't – I may be linking – I don't know when I found out Judd Apatow was a fan of the room and his people, his mm-hmm. group of actors. Mm-hmm. He was there with a couple of Jason Siegel and a couple other of his, like, group of actors. Right. And, you know, somebody was like, you should go up, you should go up to him and say, you're in the room or, you know, you, cause he's a fan. And, and I'm like, I can't do that. I just can't do that. That's weird. He's <laughs> right. at a table full of actors and I just walk up and be like, I'm Michelle in the room, you know? <laughs> right. So I didn't do that, but it was funny that happened at the same time, which is sort of weird. And like, cause, um, uh, Judd Apatow was the disaster artist and, um, anyway, it just kind of comes full circle that the, the day that I was recognized, the first day I was recognized was also the, the same day that like he was, you know, I don't know, 20 feet from me and people, somebody was pushing the same guy who recognized me was like pushing me to go over there. <laughs> like, no. Wow. So yeah, that was weird. I didn't recognize that much though. Um, okay. I don't know if I just look different or what, or I just stay within like one mile radius of my house and I don't tend to get, um, I don't t- tend to get recognized very often. Okay. So then pivoting from there, from the room to your web series. Now, when yes. you first had this idea to put together a web series, how nervous were you to make those calls or to send those emails to your friends and former coworkers to be like, all right, guys, it has been a while since... You know, we did the thing that everybody knows and loves, but how nervous were you reaching out and pitching your idea to them? I was really nervous. Um, I I was just nervous they wouldn't like it. They would say no. I would get rejected. I was really nervous. I was nervous about everything from day one. Like, <laughs> I was nervous to do the Kickstarter campaign. Mm-hmm. I was nervous that no one would donate. Mm-hmm. I thought they'll no one will like it, you know, like I, and I remember just being constantly scared, but just doing it anyway. Right. And there was kind of a quote from Eleanor Roosevelt or something that she has a quote that scare, scare yourself every day. Um, there's some quote, I think it's Eleanor Roosevelt, but I, I like that. And I think of that and I try to do that. Like if something is scary, then I want to do it, try Mm -hmm. to do it to get over that fear. And that's the only way I was able to do it was to just push through the fear of I sent it to Juliet first, the script. Mm-hmm. She responded really well to it and really liked it. And that gave me the confidence to send it to everybody else. Um, 
And I just was worried they wouldn't like it and they wouldn't want to do it. And so I asked them, we got together to do a mini documentary for Greg's book, The Disaster Artist, when that was coming out. Okay. And I asked them there, I asked Greg to be in it too. And they were like, oh, tell me more about it. And this is a nice sense of script. And it just happened gradually and incrementally. Um, after I sent it to Juliet, I went back to, and, and I, and I, she really liked it. I was like, okay, well, and I just sat on it for a while because I think I was too nervous. And mm -hmm. she came back to me. She's like, why, what happened? Why aren't we doing it? We need to be doing it. I'm like, yeah, you're right. We do need to be doing it. <laughs> right. So then I sent it to everybody else and I just did it. But I was just the whole time. And it's, it's been scary and still scary, like putting it out on your die. And I think um, when you put yourself out into the world. I'm not a naturally like uber outgoing person. I'm kind of shy. So I think when you put yourself out there, it's always a little nerve wracking. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I was really scared. <laughs> okay. was, nobody's ever asked me that question. Really? I like it. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, I think I presume that when you do something that you do it with full on gusto and confidence. <laughs> I just don't think that's really true. Yeah, definitely. I mean, probably and I anybody think, who does. Something. Yeah. And I, and I, I agree with that all the time. I'm always encouraging people to start the thing, whatever it is, podcast, short film, blog, whatever it is, just start. So, so yeah, the fact yeah. that you, as nervous as you were, as scared as you were, you did it. You had to get over that to make the thing you wanted to make. And so it worked. Uh, now, you talked about when you were on set with The Room, and you were cracking up with what was going on and what you were witnessing in this in this movie. When you then started filming the room actors, where are they now? How did you because this show is hilarious? How did you manage to keep it together during those shoots? Because knowing that you guys had to work together on this amazing, <laughs> amazingly bad film, and then also <laughs> now, years later, working together again. And kind of revisiting those characters, yeah. How did you manage to keep it together? <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, there were a lot of really funny moments on set. L luckily, because that's good. That means hopefully there's funny stuff on screen too. But um, I think it was really cathartic for us all to come together again and do something funny and fun that so sort of celebrated us as being room actors rather than us trying to like hide or stick our head in the sand and <laughs> right. like, hide from the fact that we're in this bad movie. And it was more like us stepping out into the world and saying, you know what? Screw it. We're still going to have fun with this. You know, we might be panned. Um, the acting might be panned from the room, but we can have fun and we can be decent and we're going to just, you know, poke fun at ourselves and embrace it. And it was really, really cool to get together with everybody. I had actually never met Dan Jenjigian. Really? Um, so I met him. He played Chris. Uh -huh. Yeah, I talked to him on the phone a gazillion times. I felt like I knew him. And then when we met, we're like, wait a second. Have we ever met in person? I don't think we have. And <laughs> it was really strange. Um, but yeah, so that was really cool to meet everybody. And they were so game and like jumped in with two feet and just really embraced what I had written for them. And, mm -hmm. you know, what I wanted them to do, they just did it. And they were like such great sports and they did such job everyone is the other room actors are funny in it and um it was so wonderful I just I miss it it was such a fun time and we just had a new episode with with Philip two weeks no, three three or four weeks ago mm -hmm. and that was equally fun um but that time where we shot everybody for the six day period was just like non-stop fun um we had a great crew and a great team and I mean, it was, it was just great for us to get together again and do that and have it be so positive. So Awesome. One of the things that I I really enjoyed watching the the web series, especially as a fan of The Room. I mean, I have seen it a bunch of times. So what I thought was really funny is the way that you, uh, and I will not reveal uh, kind of what happens, but anybody who has seen The Room, and you mentioned it before, one character is in the movie for a while and then suddenly he is gone and there's a character that randomly appears that we're supposed to care about and we're supposed to know who he is and how he knows all of these people the way you do that in the room <laughs> actors where are they now was super clever because i was kind of waiting for it because i was like 
all right, I wonder how she is going to play this in. And you, you crushed it. It was just a really clever way to do that switch. <laughs> Thank you so much. I love that part too. And then I have another episode written for those two actors. Nice. That's going to be very similar. And I can't wait to do that episode also. It's just, <laughs> it's just, it's fun to poke fun at like the things that are gone wrong in the room and like reinvent them in new ways. Mm -hmm. Now, what percentage of you yeah. would guess what percentage of bloopers slash outtakes did you have to cut? <laughs> did I have to cut? Mm -hmm. Oh, a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there were a lot of things. There were a lot of really funny moments. I mean, the thing about when you edit something is you can't always keep even things you love because it doesn't make sense or it's too long or the continuity is off. Or there's mm -hmm. a plane that flew over right at that moment. You know, like right. there's so many things that go into what you choose to put on screen that a lot of times have nothing to do with what's the funniest or you hope you get the funniest performance and everything else is perfect. Um, but we had a lot of improv actors on set too. So okay. like Craig Kukowski plays the documentarian and um, I had, you know, he, he read what I wrote, but then I also let, you know, let him play with it and come up with stuff. So he came up with some really funny stuff. We couldn't keep it all in, you right. know, so we have some moments. And um, mm -hmm. same thing with this guy, Jordan Black. He's in episode two. He's really funny. And he came up with some really funny moments that totally cracked our crew up. And we couldn't. It's just so hard, like, when you're the director and you're trying not to laugh. <laughs> but it's really right. funny that it's good. But you can't be like, ah, you've just got to be dead silent. So <laughs> right. that you don't ruin the take but um yeah it'd be fun to show some deleted scenes sometime or some bloopers i am a i'm a, a sucker <laughs> for for behind the scenes uh stuff like that so i am all on board now when you when you started you know you were on the festival circuit for a while funny or die has established itself as one of the best places to find consistently quality independent comedy shows and programs during that festival run when did those calls or when did those communications start with funny or die and when did that start to feel real like it was actually going to happen yeah i met them at the holly web film festival they were mm -hmm. on a panel and so i went up to them afterwards and got their card and stuff and um gave them the link and i think that was in march and then I followed up a few times when they watched it. You know, Chris over there, Chris um, Michael got back to me and he said, I haven't even finished it, but I really love it. And, you know, it's perfect. And then he did eventually finish it. And um, they, you know, told me they wanted to launch it on Funny or Die. Um, they have a new partnership program. So they mm -hmm. wanted to meet a partner with them. And it's different. It's not, it's not a Funny or Die original. You know, they right. didn't fund it and all that stuff. But, um, but they'll do the marketing for me. So they'll blast it to their followers and all of that. And, um, and anyway, so that was back in May, but they wanted me to wait until now to launch it. So mm -hmm. I've been sitting on it for a long time and that's been hard to sit on it. I've wanted to put it out, but you, you know, the timing makes sense now. Absolutely. I mean, it, and it is yeah. a great company to partner with because at that same Holly web fest where you met them, so you have been nominated at almost every web fest that you go to for comedy. So at the Holly Web Festival, you won the award for Best Ensemble, which yes. is awesome. And that is a huge kudos because like you and I were talking about before we were recording, for to take the Citizen Kane of bad movies where it just gets panned all the time to then bring those people back together and win Best Ensemble for a web series is tremendous so huge huge kudos to you for that thank you that was it was a real shock when we got here <laughs> um and that, i think that's what i said in the speech is like when you you're known for being in the worst movie ever made you never think you'll win an acting award so it was really right it was really fun fantastic so i think that about wraps it up uh this has been an absolute blast it is so great to kind of catch up with you again we have kept in contact since uh vancouver web fest and we have talked about doing something like this we tried to work yeah. together back then and it was just too crazy because vancouver web fest for anybody who has a web series i highly highly recommend 
checking out Vancouver Web Fest. Suzette, who runs it, is just an absolutely amazing champion of independent artists. Yeah, she is. Of all the web fests I've been to, and I've been to a lot, mm-hmm. she was by far the friendly, like just really, really effusively friendly and welcoming to everybody, spoke to everybody, like hugged me. Every time I, I walked through the door, she's like, Robin, and give me a huge <laughs> hug. Made me feel totally welcome and invited and wanted. And it was just such a great experience. Um, and they do a really cool like speed dating thing there too, where you get to meet a lot of industry people. Mm-hmm. In Canada. Yeah. So huge shout out to Vancouver Web Fest. Uh, thank you again, Robin, for making the, the time to do this. And also- thank you so much for having me, John. We appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And where can people find the show? Where can people find you and just kind of the best up to date information on on the social medias? Okay, so our website is www.theroommockumentary.com. You Mm -hmm. can learn more about our show there. On Facebook, we're at The Room Actors. Where are they now? Um, On Twitter, we're at The Room Actors. On Instagram, we're at The Room Actors. And my my Facebook is Robin Paris. um, So you can find me there. And I also, my website is robinparis.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, you can just, I don't know if you just are totally bored and you want to go to every possible media <laughs> outlet one day, that's where you can find us. Excellent. So. And I will put all of those links in the show notes below. <laughs> and of course, funny or die slash Robin Paris as well. And yes. new episodes drop uh, on Fridays for on funny or die for the next few weeks, right? uh well thursdays thursdays okay yeah so yeah thursday starting at november 30th um for four weeks i've got six more episodes written and ready to go um so we've shot the four and i just hope that after we launch these on funny or die we'll get some funding to finish our series excellent which would be awesome i mean the timing is is perfect the show is hilarious like i said all of the links will be in the show notes below Definitely check it out on Thursdays on Funny or Die slash Robin Paris. Uh, Again, I've been speaking to Robin Paris, who played Michelle in The Room. Uh, Again, it has been a blast. I look forward to seeing the reaction that people have to these as they drop, because Mm -hmm. I had a blast. I watched these months ago at Vancouver Web Fest, got the chance to watch them many more times once you sent the link. It is an incredible show. So I, I'm very proud of you of the work that you are doing. And I, yeah, I can't wait for more people to see it. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. And thanks for taking a look at it and um, having me on and, and, you know, putting it out there. And um, yeah, I'm excited to share it with everybody. So I appreciate it. Excellent. All right, Robin. Well, that wraps it up for this episode of About to Interview. Uh, thank you again so much for being on. Thanks for having me. I hope to talk to you again soon. Sounds good. Thank you for listening to the About to Interview podcast, which is an About to Interview production. Make sure to click the subscribe button below, give a thumbs up, and check out the full show notes with links to the guests below, as well as on the website abouttoreview.com. Thank you to my amazing guests, and also thank you to Vexing Media, who provides audio and video editing services for this podcast. They are a graphic design website design and digital media company you can find all of their work at vexingmedia.com as well as on facebook and twitter at vexing media make sure to follow the podcast on all forms of social media facebook twitter and instagram at about Treeview, and subscribe to the podcast about Treeview, which comes out every wednesday <laughs>